We're going to talk about Dynex, but before we get into anything to do with this amazing cryptocurrency, this amazing technology, I want to get a little bit of an introduction on who you are for the audience. So if you could take it away, how'd you find yourself here? Yeah, sure. For those who don't already know me or haven't already seen me, I've, I've been around a while, but my name's Clifford. Uh, I'm Dynex's head of ecosystem and IT security infrastructure. Um, what does that mean? So I'll, I'll split my job into two and explain that. I do a lot of the security side of Dynex, right? I'm the one that looks after making sure that we adhere to the highest form of, of security, um, pushing forward for continuous, you know, using of the, the best methodologies. And if there's anything that comes up around security, then I'm the one to literally go off and, and make sure it's it's looked at with all, you know, possible elements and and we take no risks when it comes to security so it's one of the biggest jobs i do but is one of the least talked about at, at all to be fair because realistically we don't want to tell people how we're doing the security that that would give away the tricks right <laughs> so mm. but my other side is head of ecosystem and I, I cover a lot of areas right like i i regularly have meetings with all of our moderators in discord um, we regularly have chats with our KOLs and our investors. Um, we do a lot of uh, a lot of meetings with you know other other staff, um, different departments. I pretty much go to as many of them as I can so that they can have me as that connection bridge. Right, if they need to figure something out and they're having issues, then well, we can obviously sort that out and and get them the answers they need. So, plus I do interviews like this i do interviews like this uh do interviews for you know tv appearances i, I did one in january for the nasdaq and, and bloomberg so that was one of the scariest and most fulfilling things i've done in a while to be fair that was uh quite quite an experience but you know i've been in crypto 10 years now i thought it was about time that i learned some of the other sides of crypto so when dynex you know and bear in mind, I did this for a year for, for effectively for free for Dynex. I, I worked all the way from 2023 to, to the beginning of 2024, um, you know, unpaid. I just offered assistance, guide, you know, guide a few people to a, to a, an outcome or even just, you know, theoretical work. Um, I built up quite a relationship with Dynex. So when... When I got back from doing the NASDAQ meeting, I kind of realized that my my role was already progressing into something a lot bigger. So we talked about making it formal at that point. Wow. Okay. So you went formal after you did the the interview and the meeting yeah. with the NASDAQ people. Yeah, That's I wasn't crazy. even employed. I wasn't even employed by Dynex at that point. I did they it. They just as... trusted you, understood you were a good face of the project, which being like head of an ecosystem like that is a huge role because you have to understand on a pretty high level every single part of the company because yeah. you never know who you're talking to or what they're going to ask you. But what was... I'm very fascinated because I didn't know that you guys did an interview with people from the NASDAQ. So what was that like for you? And then what were some of the questions that they were kind of asking? So I'll, what I'll do is I'll send you the link to it afterwards um, so that you can watch it for yourself. But yeah, that would be awesome. See how different I am then to how I am now. Like my confidence is a lot different back now compared to then. Yeah. Uh, but You're probably shaking. <laughs> I, I did a good job holding in the nerves, um, to say the least. It was very nerve wracking for, you know, what was a 17 minute video turned into, you know, me being there for three hours um, God. for 17 minutes is crazy, right? But it was very, very um, unique. But how many people in the world right now can say they've had an interview at the NASDAQ? I mean, yeah. that's a very short list, right? Yeah. But relative terms, it's a short list. So... For me, it was one of those things that I can tick off the list and say thank you. I've done it now once. Um, although there might be there might be some talks of of another one coming. Ooh, that's exciting. Uh, yeah. What were they really harping in on? What were like? So they wanted to understand like the sectors that we were we were interested in getting into. Whether we'd already had some communication with those companies, they wanted to understand what our ideas and what our business model was. 
um, which was a lot different than like most conversations because they want to all know about the crypto side. They didn't. They wanted to know about how we were we were merging those two industries into you know what Dynex is doing, and what we talked about back then is kind of even outdated now. And that's crazy to think, right? In the in the space of seven months, a lot has changed in Dynex. When I went there, we had no subscription model. We were paying on spot job pay as you go only. We didn't have any of the new facilities that we've got for Dynex quantum circuits, for example, which is like another big monumental leap forward for Dynex. Um, we didn't have all of these. We didn't even think they were going to be possible. Now they are possible. Suddenly, now it's a whole different conversation they want to have when we're, when the possibility of me going back is. They're going to be... Yeah. They're going to be asking some very different and very, um, very, very different questions at the next one, I suspect. Oh, I imagine. Yeah, because I've been watching the number of jobs that you guys have been having month over month just yeah, absolutely take off since you guys pivoted to that subscription model. So yeah, I don't know if you have any insight on that. You guys got that big partnership with um, the name of the company is evading me right now, but they the technology. Yeah, they've been really helping promote you guys, and it's a very yeah. reputable company to be doing I mean. That. So there's a couple of them that have now really sort of started to, now they're starting to really get what Dynex can do, how it can benefit them. Now suddenly you see the uptake suddenly, right? It's a, it's a big jump this month. Mm -hmm. That's also to do with, obviously, we're test rolling some new software that we're going to be rolling out. Um, we've already shown showcased a few bits of it, which will be Dynex GPT. Um, so that is our very first quantum LLM framework. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this goes one step further now because Sam couldn't just be content with doing one GPT. He made it so that you can train any GPT on Dynex. Um, so wow. the Quantum LLM will allow uh, ChatGPT 4, uh, 4.0, and then obviously the new one, which I believe is dubbed Strawberry, um, the new one that they're doing. So that will be potentially able to be ran on ours as well. Um, and we're... We literally got people biting our arms off ready to use this. It's just these things take time, right? Like we're not talking about something that's already out there. We're talking about building something brand new that's never been done, not in this scale. Yeah. Uh, that comes with challenges. Absolutely. What would be some of the benefits that like people might see by using a quantum LLM over just the traditional ones that are being used in the new strawberry AI? To be fair, that's a great question, right? Don't forget, quantum isn't for every purpose out there. It's not. Um, although we keep showcasing that you can bend it to our, uh, you know, to what we want it to do, which kind of has a double-edged sword because people keep hearing us saying it doesn't do what we what, everything we want it to do, and then we come out with it three months later, and oh yes, it can do what we're we're wanting it to do. But Dy Dynex and Quantum LLM were not even scheduled to be available till probably the beginning of next year. Um, so we're quite far ahead, but we also know that there'll come a point where we hit some roadblocks and that will slow down the progress, right? It's natural evolution of the de development. You can't be 100 million miles an hour every day. There are going to be stumbling blocks, parts where you've got to go back a step before you can go another step forward. Um, you know, that's just part of development. And I can understand that most because I came from a development background. So, yeah, I for for twenty years I've run my own development firm um, and cybersecurity firm. So of course that's why they brought me in on security and why they they you know wanted me to help push their development forward with with all these different departments because I've got the experience. But I've been enjoying every minute of it. Right, it's a new challenge for me. Um, I've never had to manage so many people before, mm. so it's a challenge for me. Um, I'm doing okay. Um, I did almost burn myself out after eight months of going at 15 hours, you know, hours a day, seven days a week, but three weeks uh, holiday recharged all the batteries, so I'm feeling pretty good at, at the moment. So I fired up and ready to go, and absolutely. Got right, right when you absolutely. landed, we got you back. So. Um, as, as far as the security, you have a, a large background in security. Are you securing the job information? Are you securing access to the, the like data sets? What exactly are you specializing on for security? So, 
So it's actually really interesting because I've just finished all the documentation for this literally yesterday. <laughs> all of that documentation was finished. So we've had a lot of documentation to get ready for compliancy, right? We're, we're compliant with Mika for Europe for digital assets. We're compliant for GDPR and data protection in Europe and the UK. And then obviously recently we had to make sure we were HIPAA compliant for America for healthcare data. Right. And healthcare data over in America is even more crazier than most people think, right? Like, and I mean, really crazy. The list of requirements was 55 pages long to give you an idea. It was brutal, right? But that's where, you know, having lawyers and, and legal opinions come in very handy, right? We're, we're not opposed to having to use a lawyer if we need to, to make sure that we're being compliant. And that's very sensible from any business, right? Um, having a good lawyer is is uh, not a bad suggestion for any blockchain people out there, right? If you're thinking of doing a blockchain, go get a good lawyer because the 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 paperwork involved when you start getting all the compliance is is crazy. But we're so far we we've just come back with with that we'll be compliant with HIPAA um, because what we don't do is send anything that is unique to you. So there's no name, no address. Right. If you need to do a a, a a lock on the your data because you're shipping it off with other data, right, and you want it all back, and then you go, well, whose data does this belong to? You've got to have some kind of ID, right? So we use what's called ID tagging to just tag the job so you know which job and which chunk of data that is yours bit of data. But unless you add both sides of the equation, you wouldn't even be able to understand that data. It would be completely gob- garbled up. It's it's AES 256 with uh, 2048 RSA key. So it's like military grade at the moment. And that's what we're running right now. And we're, you know, the moment we've got the option, um, I've been with Sam's help, our quantum architect. Um, we've been developing our new quantum encryption um, mm. should really push the boundaries of what encryption can be. So we want to take it to the next level and make it even further resilient, even to a quantum machine so that, you know, it's it's encrypted by a quantum machine, but not it can't be cracked by a quantum machine. Right. Taking the same kind of um, hash algorithms that we have on the traditional computers and just parlaying it over to a quantum computer. Now, is the current infrastructure that you guys are using for encryption and securing everything like similar to the zero knowledge proofs or the different vaults that a lot of crypto and blockchain based companies are using to secure this HIPAA data? Or is it a unique model for you guys? So it's a, it's like a, the best way to describe it is a hybrid variant, right? So the big portion that's really that's got to be HIPAA compliant stays on the machine that's sending it. So therefore, there really is no, no, you you know, personal data being transferred at that point, mm-hmm. right? What you're getting is an ID and a ton of different unique variables like leg 15, which doesn't mean anything unless you understand both sides of the code. And even if you could decrypt it, you, all you're going to see is leg 15. It doesn't mm-hmm. make any, it doesn't make any understanding, right? So you'd have to reverse engineer it for one. Then, because it gets chunk loaded, right? So it gets split into a million pieces and sent across our network. Well, unless you want to reconstruct every piece, you're never going to have every piece, right? You're already doing a small piece of the pie. So not only are you going to have to reverse engineer it, right, which takes time, and if you can, because you've got to know how many pieces there are to the pie, every job is unique. It, it will just randomize to the different size chunks so that nobody can then catch on how many we're using. Because again, it's just another step ahead of everyone else, right? Like I'm mm-hmm. not going to tell you how I randomize it because that would give people too much an easy route into figuring it out. But just let's say it's random enough that even a even a computer would struggle. So you know, we're we're randomizing certain bits to be ahead of of the curve, basically, and then we split it. It distributes it across the network. So you've got to learn reverse engineering. Then you're going to have to decrypt the the really strong key, and that's that's the same as the DoD currently uses. Mm. So I'm sure that they would want to chat with you if you broke that, right? Then obviously you've got to understand what that data even means, and if it's just 
raw computed data, you're not going to understand what the hell that means. Like it really is the, like we, yeah, it's pretty secure. There's layers upon layers. To yeah. Basically it. think of it like an onion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how Tor network exists, right? It's like a layer of an onion. Mm -hmm. so each layer is, is almost separated from the next. And that's no different for our system. It's massively complex, but it has to be. Yeah. In order. Yeah. Especially if you're going to do business in countries that have 55 pages of documentation to yeah. come to their. And that's just for the healthcare data. Never mind the yeah. other privacy data stuff, right? We're, we're in the process of um, applying for ISO 2701 um, nice. accreditation as well. So that's the highest form of data privacy going and how you handle documents and how you handle data. So all of that is going to be, we're going to really go hard here because if we can get that, there's not many blockchain companies out there that are ISO accredited. There's, there's maybe a handful. Yeah, Maybe. no, it makes sense if you already have the infrastructure to deal with that kind of data. Why not throw your hat a hand in the the pot? Um, I had a question that was popping up in my head. Oh, the the types of jobs. What are the different like categories of jobs and kind of like fields that you guys are entering into, or at least seeing the biggest set of demand for right now? Sure. Um, so right now, there's there's a trade off. Right now, we've got uh, healthcare and automotive are probably the two heaviest sectors that we're we're currently uh, seeing data from. Um, there are a few other sectors, but not as heavy. Um, and then obviously we've got Dynex uh, development is obviously using the network right now to develop Dynex LLM. Um, so you know some of those jobs are us at the moment. Um, obviously, um, because we need to develop, if we're going to develop an LLM, we need to test run it in a live environment. Um, there's no way to test that on a test net because we would need almost an identical level of GPUs on our test net. Mm. So you can imagine, right? If there's two, if there's a hundred thousand GPUs on our network to match that, to be able to test it in a real world scenario, we'd need a hundred thousand on the other side, Like That's hard to to sell to anyone that they're going to be putting on a test net and not getting paid for yeah right? and we need like three months of this so it's really more sensible to run it on our own network at that point and figure it out plus we also find out if there's any sticking points on the existing network right because one set one person sets it up on one side one person sets it up on the other side that's still potential for a different in result to get it, you'd have to have the same person set it up in the exact same way. You'd almost have to clone it, mm -hmm. like for like. So that's yes, why not we, feasible. You know, we 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 test live, although we'd prefer not to. But when it comes to actual infrastructure, like the nodes, those do get tested offline, or well, not offline, but on our test net. We actually run our own miniature test net. Um, it's got like two GPUs on it. They're both like 10 years old. They're just enough to keep the blocks moving along for the for the test runs and such. So, and then we're able to test nodes, make sure they sync and, and so forth, you know. And are people able to run personalized nodes for the chain? Because I was watching a video from a couple months ago of that being one of the critiques for people. But then when I was looking at the website, you had the ability, I think you just needed a virtual machine in yeah. order to like set it up. Right. Right. So you can run a node. There's just no, in. it's not like an incentivized node where you get paid something in return. Um, we don't have anything for our, our node operators as of yet. Um, we are considering something, um, but we're still early on in the phase of how do we, how do we commercialize that? How do we justify that? Because that's going to, Whatever we do about incentivizing like the rest of the ecosystem like that is going to come away from the miners. And that's ultimately not a good idea, right? We want the miners on our network. So we don't want to dig into their profits by any stretch. We want to push their profits, right? That's that's the whole idea of the ecosystem mm -hmm. to make it profitable enough that people just leave their existing hardware on there for months at an end. Why? Because right. it's not profitable for them, so therefore they stay online. We know, we know how crypto miners are. They're, 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 you know, some of those are even worse than crypto traders. Let's be honest, right? 
um you know they just jump they jump as as soon as the profit is there in a different coin so i get that right everyone's everyone's got their own you know choices when it comes to crypto some people are looking at it long term some people look at it a lot shorter term it really depends on your situation which is why you know i'm always a big fond believer of never spend more than you can afford to lose in crypto personally mm -hmm. right like you know i'm sure that i'm sure you've got some horror stories of coming either close or already done where you've lost a lot of money i mean i've i've been in it 10 years trust me i've lost a lot of money in crypto <laughs> i've lost an awful lot of money in it's a it's a coming to coming of age story. You have to lose an obscene amount of money that you didn't think you'd have in the first place. In That's order to actually get very your, true. I, I your battle scars. I, yeah, yeah. But you know, I've learned by my mistakes, and now I'm learning that I'm I'm done jumping around every five days with different projects. I just want to find a project that now is doing real world stuff because it's time for blockchain to to grow up and mature a little bit. Right, it's ten years old now. And we're still talking about it just about for finance. Yeah. But blockchain as a technology is so much more. Yeah, it is. So, and there's, I feel like a lot of people, a lot of different companies or innovators in the space have it set in their mind that there's only one viable model to move forward with stuff. And so it's like, we're taking the same exact model that can't be applicable to every single use case and trying to just like force it in and make it so that everything fits. Yeah. And kind of on that note, one of the things that you'd said a second ago was trying to find incentivization for node operators without taking from the miners. And the miners are the ones who are lending the GPU to allow you to simulate the quantum computers. Have you guys toyed with the idea of a dual token ecosystem in which you're kind of... Not quite, but we have considered something that we're dubbing quantum nodes, and these are going to be very unique. I can't really speak much to about it at the moment because we're still ironing out the rough spots of how we're going to do this, but it has the potential to reward node operators um, without affecting what's already going, what's already going on. Can you, uh, without so that speaking, would be super interesting. Without speaking towards any of the specifics, can you tell me what a quantum node is? Yeah, so. To be compliant in certain countries, we have to geo ring fence a set of GPUs around a node um, so that they're geo locked inside of the say say the, the states right for HIPAA mm -hmm. right a lot of HIPAA requirements require that healthcare data even if it's anonymized does not leave the USA. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you do that? So we now need a quantum node that will act as a bridge that still locks in on the network but also be able to give us that geo ring fence of so many GPUs to need for that, that computational job. So if it needs 500 GPUs, it will go and find 500 GPUs in the States. All those, all those in the, those units will get directed to send all their data to that specific quantum node. So it's going to be unique. Um, we're not quite there yet of how we're going to monetize and, and commercialize that right because obviously that has to be factored in because we need to pay our node operator who's actually acting like a general hub and mm -hmm. right like there's a lot to still figure out about that but i think ultimately once that's actually active it, it opens up new avenues for for other clients because we've got geo ring fencing but it still effectively comes back to our server yeah and yeah so you kind of have these these localized quantum nodes acting as that kind of wall between the data. So it's like a mini Correct. ecosystem within the Correct. broader ecosystem. Okay. Correct. That's, that's called, uh, I am glad I'm not trying to figure that one out. That's going to yeah, be very Like, honestly, the, the complexity of that is crazy because there's so much to think about and how do we then push that, that cost into the ecosystem? So it's all on chain because we want to make sure that everything is above board and transparent in that way. Right. With, with, we're trying to do as much transparency without breaching data protection, you know, but there's a, there's a border of where we can and can't go. So we want to show what we're, we're putting in the dispenser, right? That's, that's on chain. That's basically the subscription fees being bought up on the, on the network. So for me, that's what it's about is about making sure that we're being as transparent as possible without breaking the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, got to be a difficult thing to do but definitely oh it's a fine line 
Yeah, it's in really this fun space fun. specifically. Changing a little bit of the topic, but not too much, because I saw the other day you guys shattered through a record when it comes to quantum volume, and uh, I have a couple questions as it pertains to it because you guys beat the previous record by like one point two yeah. quintillion times yeah, or something all. crazy like that. What is that? What is quantum volume? Could you explain what that is? So I didn't run this one. Um, I, I was still on holiday, but obviously breaking records is always fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but the problem is a lot of these benchmarks and a lot of these world records were never de- devised with something as raw as Dynex is, right? Mm-hmm. So they might have thought, oh, well, most they'll have is a couple of hundred GPUs. No, no, no. They didn't factor in that kind of magnitude bigger. Right, where we can just go, we'll have the whole network, please, all you know, hundred thousand GPUs, and we'll just absolutely hit it, right? And that's basically what we can do. And the problem is, there's no benchmark that can really sustain what we're doing, right? When we did the Q score, it was ginormous, right? Like it was like this big and this big. It looked silly, right? Almost to the point of like ludicrousy. And mm-hmm. then suddenly you get people going, well, that can't be right. It's too ridiculous. But it is because what they're not factoring is, is just the raw capability of what our network offers, right? If you if you request 5,000 qubit, that's like three, four, 500 GPUs. That's more than what most people will ever have access to for computation. And then you're speeding that up with quantum algorithms inside of a custom-built quantum environment. Suddenly... You know, your magnitudes, and I mean real magnitudes, like beyond what they should be, right? We, It's quite funny because it was like 2 to the power of 100, right? Something like that, I believe it was. And the previous record was 2 to the power of 20. Yeah, yeah. The quantum volume. Yes. We could have probably put an extra zero on the end of that. <laughs> oh, my God. And even yeah. that is just to put it in scale for people, like ludicrous, because I believe yeah. the number of observable atoms in the universe is... Well, I think it's 10 to the power of 83, but yeah. like you get, that's the, the scale at which the multiples yeah, are right now. Pretty insane. Absurd. And I guess yeah. it, it makes sense given that they've just previous competitors had not, um, even it, it attempted this type large. of thing. Yeah. They've never scaled that large because the biggest physical computer, like quantum computer only has 1100 qubits. Right. We generate that on 100 GPUs. Yeah, you guys set that record earlier this year at like 10,000 qubits. And this is not a linear scale, guys. This is a Ooh. exponential scale. So yeah. beating it on an exponential scale by an order of magnitude is how you get stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, and it is really ridiculous, right? Because you look at it and you go, that was, that was a fucking joke, right? Like, yeah. they're just they're giving it all the, the, the marketing ball, right? Like, everyone, everyone's already spoke to us about this. Like, they're... Uh, and my answer to that is like, feel free to download the code. It's open and it's, we open sourced it. Feel free to run it on Dynex and see for yourself because you'll still get the same result. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's not marketing. Thing, right? We're not hiding our, our tools that we use to benchmark. Actually, we do the complete opposite. It's like, here's the tools. Please run it yourself. See what, what you think. Right. Um, yeah. And that to me is the best way of being because now there's no, there's no, like misconception that we've misunderstood what we're doing. There's no misconception that the result is what we we have given, because now you can run it yourself, see those results for yourself. Now, now it's not us running it. Now it's you, and suddenly those results now speak for themselves. It's just it is quite funny when you see the result page, right? When it's so like ridiculous. Like when we did CFD benchmarking, right? The results were insane. Like, we thought it was going to go logarithmic, right? So as we started really scaling it up to the number of vectors that we were doing, right, we would see a drop off. We would see it just start to get creep up on the time. There was nine second difference between like the heaviest workload and the and the lightest workload on quantum. When I did that with $40,000 worth of GPU, right, we started with one and we ended up with eight, Right, mm-hmm. even eight was still forty-five minute time for run times. Dynex was less than eight minutes. Wow! So, 
you know that's yeah, it's, when you yeah. start realizing wow this thing isn't it isn't about the data size right it's about how you deliver that data so if you can build your quantum algorithm really insanely efficient it'll finish in a split second because it's you, you've tailored it around how the system works so it really does lend itself to some amazing things yeah and there's more coming out just we wait for the next announcement batch like that's going to be really interesting because there's some interesting stuff in that one. Oh man i'm excited i'm yeah. excited but it's what happens like even you guys have a hundred thousand gpus like you've said a few times and that's like i think renders got like three to four thousand and i know they're not i think even, it's a little bit down at the moment thing, but... just because the market's down obviously we do see you know periodic drop-offs of miners and stuff like that when when price of crypto is down yeah but generally they you know we bounce anywhere from sort of 70 to 120,000 depending on the market conditions which is crazy condition is good it'll be 120,000 again I can guarantee it almost yeah yeah as soon as as soon as stuff starts becoming more and more profitable for them then you're gonna see the network double it's yeah gonna... I'm excited yeah, and for I that. When when Dynex was the most profitable thing to mine, we had somewhere in the region of half a million on our network. Oh we God. gave it the biggest stress test you've ever seen. Um, and we we did that. Like We pushed a lot of jobs over it when it was that big because we needed to. We needed yeah. to understand if there was any you know rough edges that needed smoothing out where where it could cause hiccups and, and where it could cause problems. So actually having that that small blip of where we were the most profitable thing by some way actually made a really good benefit for us to stress test the network yeah gave you that that set of data points now so that yep. when it happens again you guys can move forward in a more right. seamless manner yep. and start shattering some of these records that you're setting right now i'm a, do you have a date as to when that next uh push is going to go for publications and stuff so i can keep an eye out so there is some announcements coming this week. There'll be some announcements next week. And if all goes to plan while I'm in Italy at the end of the week, uh, at the end of the month, um, then there'll be a third announcement. Okay. All right. So there's just that constant stream of, of publications. Yeah. Love to see. yeah, we're going to be busy for the next month. I, I can promise you that one. I'm like my, my schedule is now packed to the end of the yeah. month. And I've only been back at work two days. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine you guys are moving quickly, especially you said that you you guys sped up the creation of a quantum LLM from something that was supposed to happen at the end of this year going into next year till now. Yeah. Did that have to did you guys push around things on the roadmap or is it just that you're speeding through everything so quickly right now? It's a bit of a combination of both. There were some bits that we've had to push to one side just because we're waiting for other people to get back to us. So you know, like we were all all for uh, like full on with AWS integration, right? We got the integration done. We're now just waiting on AWS. So rather than having to just sit there and wait and twiddle our, you know, twiddle our thumbs, we actually decided, okay, we'll put that to one side until they get back back to us, and then we will um, effectively just bring it back onto the onto our to do list as soon as it's we've had a reply. So. Because we've got a lot on our to-do list. Like if you saw our our Trello board, right? What we've got with all the different things on it, it mm -hmm. there's like 400 items on it. But those 400 items disappear off like as fast as you can believe. Like it's it's fairly busy. Like, yeah. All the staff are doing something. All of our teams are doing something. Like we've got Dan, one of our sales guys. He's down in Mexico right now. We got Danny, our co-founder. She's over in Switzerland for a meeting, heading down to to another place today. Then she's back out to New York, and then back to back to Switzerland four days later. Like we aren't slowing down. Yeah, yeah. The four hundred data points are just data, or the four hundred objectives are just data points in this in this yep. quantum machine you guys have built. Yep. And what is uh, Sam's ability to realize what he's doing? Like the 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 idea of quantum LLM was something that we've had on the roadmap since beginning of the year. But a lot of it came down to actually figuring out the best way to run quantum circuits. Um, because now we can run quantum circuits. Now, effectively, everything out there that runs on a quantum circuit can now run on Dynex. And that's mm -hmm. what it Can you give everyone a reminder, myself included, what is a quantum circuit? Sure. 
So there's quantum circuits and then there's quantum gates, right? The easiest way to think of it is your quantum circuits are all your variables. Your quantum gates are all of your conditions. So that's all your ands, ifs, ors, and ors, xors, all of those kind of things. So that's we tried to break it down a little easier because when we were calling it neuromorphic chips, it was a little bit ambiguous, right? What we were finding was people were thinking that we were going to manufacture chips. Uh, we put out of, uh, a bit of information, or Sumi did, about a, qu a neuromorphic quantum chip, and the whole uh, whole Twitter went mad around it. Like, what are you doing building this? It's an, you know, you're you're building an ace. No, we're not. We're not building anything. Research is important, right? To know how we stay competitive, mm -hmm. and also how we stay one step ahead of our competitors. So, learning about neuromorphic chips though has been fascinating. Like, really has been, but. There's no way we're funding 150 million investment to build one because that's what it would cost. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, I imagine the chip, the chip game gets very expensive. I remember yeah. going to NVIDIA's AI summit earlier this year and they talked about how they spent like a billion plus dollars building out the newest chip that they're manufacturing. Yeah. So it's like the, the, the B100 and yeah, those, yeah, the Blackwell chips. Yeah, they it's, look amazing, but they also look ridiculously expensive. Yeah, they get disgustingly expensive. Yeah. So it's better just to stick in your lane and and find that one niche that you guys can excel at. And, and I think you guys have done that. I think you guys are. Oh, we're making we're making you know good progress, but there's still loads to be done yet. Like we've barely even scratched the surface of what Dynex can truly do. Like the way that we find that out is onboarding clients and really pushing hard the network right so yeah uh, we want to get it to a point where we're running at least 10 jobs every second mm. because that would be a mega achievement right and then we've got we've actually set ourselves internal goals right my first target is a bit like you know how casper always talks about their 10 blocks a second right and they're 32 blocks a second we've got our own internal version like it's not it's not blocks per second it's jobs per second right of how many <laughs> computational jobs we can run a second and i want it I want that really high. Actually, I've asked Ivan, our developer, to see if we can actually build a jobs per second ticker for us mm. to, to be able to actually see it. a bit like what you see with, with block explorers and TPSs, right? That's what I want to see. I want to see more. I want to see way more stats like that because those are the things that I know it's daft and it's probably not a stat that anyone really cares about, but it is when it comes to the crypto side, right? Because it's, it's one of those things that they want to know about. Yeah, so, well, I was going to say Wall Street's going to love that kind of a stat. Then they get to see yeah. exactly what kind of revenue you guys are potentially charging. Oh, yeah, you could you could probably, based on our our uh, jobs per second, you could probably at, average out what we're making based on that. To be yeah, any a little bit of an out of the box question, but any any talk internally about one day going public with the company, going IPOing somewhere? You guys already have that connection point. Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble. <laughs> um, there, there might have been some conversation, um, but we're not interested just yet. We're not ready for that. I think for a company to go public like that would take a lot of things being in place first, mm -hmm. right? A lot of things. And and we still got to get to a point where the, the, the regulators are okay with what we're doing, right? Because we're brand new. We're we don't even fall within the regulations in some regards, right? Because the compute isn't being ran on our own equipment, so therefore we don't fall under that stat. Mm -hmm. But we still make sure we're compliant around that because we don't want to give them a reason to shut us down, right? So that's why we're doing all the compliancy stuff. But equally so, there are a lot of uh, what we do doesn't fall into a lot of the regulation right now. So we're, we're trying to be proactive around that, right? To stay ahead of, of any weird things like we got we got conversation around mika quite early so we made sure that you know before before mika was effectively enacted i think that was like april it went live no maybe june actually um but we did it in december we were completely compliant we deprivatized our network we brought up our new block explorer with all of our history suddenly unlocked obviously we can't unlock the part of the chain that's already privacy but what we can do is every time somebody then starts to cycle out their coins, it's unlocking more and more. And we've actually put that stat on the Block Explorer, how much is actually out there. 
So you can just look, the way to work out what's still in privacy is basically total supply in circulation minus total supply that's in the public. There's how much is left over still in the public, uh, in the private wallets. Because that might be just somebody who bought and, and has forgot about their wallet. Could be somebody who lost a wallet, right? There's always going to be that potential. So we wanted to make sure that those stats were very clear and, and precise. Yeah, which is very, very important, especially in the regulatory landscape, but even just public oh, okay. facing, because yeah. people pay a lot of attention to those kind of stats and yep. they won't even touch projects that don't make it clear. So yep. it's definitely important. And then same like the our, whole- Same as our leadership team, right? Everyone yeah. was really adamant that, you know, they wanted to know who the the leadership team was. Yeah. So eventually Dynex said that as soon as we got the business formation done, we'll have everyone announced. And that's what they did. They started announcing. That was keeping them keeping your word very important yeah. in order to maintain whatever trust is needed in this this okay. industry correct there's yeah i feel a lot of projects that i talk to and even myself doing uh business in the industry like it always comes back to regulation and it's shocking i don't want to get too deep into it because it'll bore a lot of the people but like getting to go so i li- i lived in florida and i was um, doing some unofficial lobbying in Florida for crypto and blockchain and like going and talking to the congressional leaders from Florida at the Capitol, like none of them have any idea what's going on. And so like you really, it's not even just about coming in and making sure that you fit into the compliance that they've set out because there is no compliance that has been set right. out. So it's an eyes going, shaping the compliance and then trying to fit into it and making them understand everything. And I imagine for some quantum computing AI integration with the blockchain, they're going to be like, I don't know, man, just, just cut me a check and I'll write something down. It's been, it's been a tricky situation, right? Because blockchain has a load of rules around it. Quantum has a load of rules around it. Cryptocurrency has a lot of rules around it. And so does AI. And we somehow have to fit into all of that. And it is not easy. So, you know, there are times where we've had to go and, you know, seek lawyers and and stuff to make sure we're good. There's been other times where we've had to completely rewrite it because by the time we release something else, it doesn't mean anything anymore. We've suddenly gone beyond it. And now there's this new problem that now that opens up. So we have to rewrite it and, and refine it. So it's a lot of work, but hey, nobody said this is, this was going to be easy, right? Nobody. Right. And especially when you're going right to the very cutting edge of technology. We're not talking just like, you know, a little bit getting your feet wet in, in new technology. We've gone right to the very head of the line. A bit like Casper did, right, with their crazy block speeds. They went right to the head of the line of development. And that's basically what we, both of us have been doing for the last two years, basically, just full steam ahead. Yeah. Which is good. It's what's what's needed from the leaders in the industry. So you love to see the people, but it also just means that you're going to be working more 15-hour days as the, the bull market. Oh, I suspect that it'll probably up. be more like a 16, 17-hour day in the bull run. Yeah. But I, when, the, when the cycle comes, none of us are going to be complaining about working that many hours. I know. It's going to become that, that obsession that you're just yeah. like, what else would I be doing? What do you mean? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered a lot of things here and I don't want to bombard everyone with too much information. I do, however, want to know from your side of everything, how, what's been one of the most exciting things for you personally to work on in this with Dynax and everything? So, I mean, going to do the Nasdaq meeting was super exciting, right? For me, one of those things that I don't think I would have ever been asked to do ever in my life. So that was a really big thing to tick off my my list to do. Um, By the looks of it, I'm heading to Italy at the end of the month. Um, If all goes well, that is going to be one of the largest business deals I've probably ever been involved in. Um, So that's awesome. Um, And also one of the coolest, to be fair. It's not every day I get that option, so... Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. And then by the looks of it, I think end of October, I'm in Dubai for Blockchain Life. Um, So that's going to be awesome. If anyone's actually going to be at Blockchain Life, please feel free to give us a shout. I'll try and meet up for a a beer or two. Um, Obviously, you have to be careful in Dubai around alcohol, but uh, it's got to be sensible. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much booked up till the end of the year. And I think November, they want me to fly out to Japan. So another one off my bucket list, cause I'm a tech nerd. Come on. Like which tech nerd wouldn't want to go to Japan? Yeah. Like, I'm going to be just like, I'm going to have to leave my credit card here with the wife. Cause otherwise I'm going to get, be very broke when I get back. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that sounds like a blast. So you're getting, you're getting paid to go travel around the world and talk with some industry leaders about one of your favorite things. So yeah. it just seems like a dream come true. an through. enjoyable job. Yeah, for sure. And where, where can people find you if they wanted to reach out, have questions or just yeah, follow Yeah, sure. So obviously journey? we, we have our own Twitter. It's Dynex coin on, on X. Um, I keep calling it Twitter. It's, it's Twitter to me. I come from a different era forever. Um, but I mean, um, obviously I've got my own, it's uh, Y3TI, yeah, he crypto. Um, I'm always available on our discord and telegrams. Um, feel free to drop us a line. If you've got questions, feel free to ask them because the only way that people truly understand anything is to ask questions they don't understand. And that is not, it's not a bad thing to ask those questions, right? You shouldn't feel, as people would say, stupid asking those questions. You're asking those questions because you need to uh, to understand it in a way that, that that's acceptable in your own brain. So I never say any question stupid. To be fair, I'll try and be as as honest as I can be. Yeah, you guys saw it firsthand here. I was asking a litany of questions, and you saw how it was receptive to them all. So I had a, a great time getting here to talk with you. And even the way that I set this up was just going into the Discord and being like, "Hello, I need someone yep. who's part of the project to to respond." So you get your online 24 seven, your response time is fantastic. Yeah. I'm pretty much online all the time. So I am pretty available. Hell yeah. I'll put all of the links to everything in the description of the video. So make sure you guys check it out. Um, yeah. Thank you, Clifford. I appreciate you. No, absolutely. Thank you very much.